Today, we're gonna to look at three places you can't go and people who went there anyways. But before we get into those stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload three or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please offer to do all of the like buttons laundry, but only dry their clothes about 80% of the way. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. From 1995 to 2000, Terry Grove was the manager at the Animal Research Lab at Regents Hospital in St. Paul, Minnesota. During that time, she noticed there was an issue with a particular piece of large cleaning equipment that she and the other lab technicians used every single day. She voiced her concerns to the hospital and said that they needed to replace it ASAP because it was a disaster waiting to happen. But the hospital decided they didn't want to replace it, they wanted to fix it because they figured it was salvageable and it was more cost effective this way. But after the repairs, Terry and her team reported having the same issue with this piece of machinery. And so again, the hospital decided to fix it instead of replace it. And again, after the repairs, Terry and her team said the issue persisted. For years, Terry complained to the hospital that there were big issues with the design of this piece of equipment, that no matter how many times you try to fix it, it's always going to have this core issue, which is why it needs to be replaced. But the hospital was unwilling to spend the additional money required to replace this piece of machinery. And so eventually, Terry and the rest of her crew just had to accept that they had a faulty piece of equipment and they had to be extra cautious every time they used it. In 2004, a few years after Terry had left the hospital, a 31-year-old woman named Tracy Kraling got a job there as a veterinary technician in the same lab that Terry had worked in. Tracy was devoted to animals, and she was a diehard soccer and hockey player and fan. And in October of that year, she married the love of her life. Less than a month after her wedding day, she was in the lab finishing up for the day, and she needed to sterilize her equipment. And so she walked over to the still faulty piece of cleaning equipment called the autoclave. An autoclave is a device that looks kind of like an oven that uses superheated steam to sterilize equipment and other objects inside of it. The autoclave at Regents Hospital was a huge industrial version that staff would have to walk inside of to place their equipment and then walk out of before they started it. And the persisting issue with this autoclave was its door. It shut on its own. Once it shut, the suction that was created inside of it held the door shut. And so if you were unlucky enough to be stuck inside the autoclave, even if it was off, you couldn't open the door again. The suction was too strong. And so somebody outside the autoclave would be the only way for you to get out. The issue with this door was so bad that workers in the lab would prop the door open with a big piece of wood every time they went inside in order to guarantee it did not shut on them while they were inside. However, on this day, Tracy did not use a big piece of wood. Perhaps she thought she would only be inside for a couple of seconds, but either way, when she walked inside of that autoclave, the door shut behind her and then suction kicked in and she couldn't open it again. She was trapped. And then her worst nightmare came true when the machine turned on and the steam cycle slowly began to pick up. Unfortunately, none of her coworkers had seen her go into the autoclave and so nobody knew she was stuck and so nobody was there to open the door and let her out. And no matter how loud Tracy banged on that door and screamed and yelled, nobody would have heard her. And so eventually this superheated steam began being pumped into this room all over Tracy. Eventually, when her co-workers found her, she was still alive, but she died within 24 hours as a direct result of her steam burns. The hospital was ultimately fined $75,000 for their role in her death. If you take a trip to Hawaii, there's a good chance you'll visit the beautiful Rainbow Falls on the eastern side of the Big Island. But if you travel less than a mile upstream of those falls, you'll find an equally beautiful attraction that far less people know about, and it's called the Boiling Pots. 10,000 years ago, after a volcanic eruption, lava was flowing down the side of the mountain when it entered the Wailuku River. As the lava gradually cooled, the river water flowing all around it wound up carving out these standalone pools of water that were connected 
connected by a series of small waterfalls. These pools collectively make up the boiling pots, and they get their name because periodically the water in these pools appears to be boiling. Tourists at the boiling pots are allowed to look at the water from a safe distance on the cement overlook, but under no circumstances are allowed to actually enter the water. In 2015, Jolie Ricewig was a 62-year-old woman living in Kona, Hawaii, which is on the western side of the island. There, she owned a bed and breakfast whose main allure was that guests at this bed and breakfast got to go on these fun adventure tours with Jolie all over the island, and they almost always involved paddleboarding or swimming because Jolie was an avid outdoors person and a very talented swimmer and swim instructor, and so felt comfortable leading these types of excursions. On September 14th of that year, Jolie brought one of her male guests from her bed and breakfast out for an adventure tour at the Boiling Pots. She would have known that it was an off-limits area for swimmers because there were signs up everywhere saying as much, but Jolie wasn't planning to swim in the Boiling Pots. Instead, she was planning to float on them on inflatable rafts. And so she and this man climbed aboard their respective rafts and began paddling around one of the upper pools, taking in the incredible view of this natural phenomenon. As they were relaxing, suddenly there was this rush of water that came tumbling over the fall that dumped down into the pool they were in. It was a flash flood. And before Jolie and this man could swim outside of the pool and get to safety, the water under them began to churn violently and actually thrust them over the edge down into the next pool. And as soon as they hit the water, they had fallen off of their rafts. Now they're swimming in the water and they're feeling a current pulling them down and pulling them forward towards the next lip into the next pool. And so they both began desperately swimming towards the edge. Jolie actually grabbed the man and helped push him up and out to safety. And as soon as he was on land, he turned around to grab her but she wasn't there. And so he's looking around and all he can see is her raft floating on the surface being taken down into the rapids. And so he thinks, okay, she must have fallen into the next pool. And so on the side of the waterway, he runs down and he's looking into the next pool, the next pool, the next pool, and she's nowhere to be found. And after a few minutes of looking and not knowing where she was, he called the authorities. They came out and they launched this huge search for her, but despite searching the entirety of the boiling pots and all the way downstream, there was no sign of her. And after looking for an entire week, they never found anything. It was like she just disappeared. And so they turned the search off. As devastating as this was for the family to not have closure about what happened to Jolie, this was not a surprising outcome. In fact, it was almost an expected outcome considering why the boiling pots are off limits to swimmers. Each of the pools of water that make up the boiling pots is a deep, nearly vertical shaft of water. And at the bottom of it are these entrances to these underground tunnels. And these entrances are big enough for a person to slip inside of. And these tunnels are not short. They go on for a long ways in all different directions. In a flash flood scenario, that increased water that's flowing down the boiling pots creates this unbelievable current that inside of each of these pools is pulling straight down, which gives the water the impression that it's boiling because basically the water's tumbling over as it's being filtered up and down inside of this vertical shaft. And so if you get grabbed by this current, it's gonna pull you down and into one of these tunnels and you won't get out again unless the current releases you. And so Jolie, after helping her guest get out of the water to safety, she was pulled down and into one of these tunnels and she was held there for five months until finally the current released her and her remains were spotted just below the pots in a tide pool. Lawrence Daquan Davis, who just went by day, graduated from a military-style high school in 2009. Following his graduation, he enrolled in Job Corps, which offers young people from a low-income background free career education and vocational training. During his time in the Job Corps program, he trained as a medical assistant. And then after successful completion of Job Corps, he applied for numerous jobs all over the place, but no medical facility was ready to hire him. For a couple of years, Day consistently tried to apply to medical facility after medical facility, but after everybody kept denying him, mostly because he lacked experience or he lacked the credentials they were looking for, he eventually realized that, you know, it's probably not going to happen, that he should look into some other career field. And so he decided he would join the military. But when he took the military entrance exam, he failed the math portion and so was told he can't join the military. And so Day decided he would study and retake the exam, but he knew in the meantime he needed to make money right now. 
He was the oldest of four siblings, and his mother, who had had him when she was only 14 years old, was out of work, and Day's father was not in the picture. And so Day felt like it was his responsibility to step up and help support his family. And so he did what many other people in Jacksonville, Florida did when they were struggling to find work. He went to a temp agency. Temp agencies are staffing firms that contract with employers who are in need of temporary, part-time, or seasonal workers. The temp agency hires someone like Day and then ships them off to one of their client companies when they need work. Conceptually, this employment structure works great for all parties involved. People like Day get to have a paycheck really quickly and the companies have their short-term employment needs met on the cheap. But there's a loophole. Temp workers are legally employed by the temp agency, not by the physical location they go to to do work, known as the direct employer. This is a very important distinction because it means the temp agency is the one that has to pay for insurance for the temp worker, not the direct employer. Therefore, if a temp worker gets hurt on a temporary job, the direct employer's insurance costs will not spike. Instead, the temp agency's insurance costs will spike. Meaning the direct employer knows they can be kind of reckless with their temporary workers because there's not a big penalty if they get hurt on the job. This loophole doesn't mean much if the temporary worker is being asked to be a receptionist where it's totally safe, but this loophole matters a lot when the temp worker is asked to do something dangerous, like work with industrial machinery inside of a factory. On August 16th, 2012, Day received a call back from the temp agency he went to telling him that they had a job for him. It was at the Bacardi Bottling Corporation in Jacksonville, Florida. They told him he needed to be at the warehouse that day at 2.45 p.m. for training, and then at 3 p.m., 15 minutes later, he would start his first shift. After Day agreed to do this job and hung up with the temp agency, he excitedly called his mother to tell her that he had finally landed a real job. In fact, this would be the first job he had ever had, and so he was just very proud of himself. And his mother was very proud of him, too. And so Day asked her, you know, would you give me a ride to Walmart so I can pick up some things I need for work? I need a white shirt, I need khaki pants, I need these special industrial boots. And so his mom said, absolutely. She swung home, she picked him up. The pair went to Walmart, they picked out his whole outfit. And then from Walmart, his mother just drove him directly over to the Bacardi factory to begin his first day. Day went inside and just a couple of minutes later at 2.45 p.m., he was shown a very short safety video. That would be all the training he received. Day was brought into Bacardi to be a warehouse clerk, which basically meant he would do odd jobs around the factory that didn't require a lot of skill. And so after he watched this training video, he was told to head down to the bottling line to watch all of the bottles as they went by to make sure the labels were put on properly. Before he headed down to the floor, Day stopped in the bathroom and took a very proud selfie of himself to commemorate the start of his first shift at his first job ever. He sent the picture to his fiance, put the phone in his pocket, and then headed out the door down to his first workstation. There was a section of the factory that initially Day was not working in, where there were these huge machines called palletizers that took the finished bottles of rum and stacked them into what are called pallets so they could be shipped off to stores. These palletizers are two-story pieces of heavy machinery where the top story is just catwalks where the palletizer operator can manipulate the machines and then the first floor is where the rum actually comes into the machine and is moved around and stacked on these big metal platforms. Sometimes as the rum comes in on the conveyor belt they will fall off and smash on the ground. This started to happen about 90 minutes after Day took that selfie in the bathroom. The palletizer operator, after seeing the broken glass, called out over the radio that he needed a temp worker to come into that section of the factory and help him. Day's supervisor at the bottling line told Day to stop what he was doing and go over and help pick up the glass. There is a security camera video of Day running into the section of the factory where all the palletizers are, making himself obviously available to help pick up this glass and the operator sees him and immediately turns, he's up on the catwalk, and he points down towards the first floor, clearly telling Day, you need to get down there, that's where the glass is, go sweep it up. Day immediately walks around and goes down to the first floor of this machine and begins working. A couple of minutes later, Day comes back up to the catwalk and he looks visibly confused. He's scratching his head and just everything about his body language says something is wrong. Now, we don't know for sure what Day says next because there's no audio in this video, but he's clearly asking a question to 
the operator and also to a supervisor who's now in frame. And it looks very much like he's asking clarifying questions. Like he's confirming, you want me to go down there, right into that space down there and clean the glass up? That's what you want me to do? And clearly the operator and the supervisor have no time for questions from day. They just want him to get this done. And so there's kind of a tense interaction between the two parties before Day ultimately just decides, okay, I'll just go down and do what they asked me to do. And so Day again goes back around and you see him go down into the first floor to continue cleaning this glass. And after a few moments, the supervisor and the operator, who don't realize Day is still down there, they turn the machine back on. And after a couple of seconds, they hear a scream coming from the first floor. They look over the railing down there and they see Day. The broken glass that needed to be cleaned up was located directly underneath this metal platform that lowered the built pallets that weighed 2,000 pounds all the way down to the floor before they were shipped off and out the door. In order for Day to actually get down in there and clean this glass up, he needed to crouch way down and practically crawl on his stomach to get into this tight space. While he was in there, the machine turned back on again and he wasn't able to crawl out fast enough before this platform and 2,000 pounds of rum pressed him into the ground. It would be the equivalent of crawling on your stomach into the bottom of an elevator shaft and then having the elevator car come down and mechanically be lowered flush to the bottom with you in there. The palletizer operator and the other supervisor immediately spring into action and try to reverse this platform up off of day, but they can't do it. And so they grabbed a metal pry bar and they tried to pry the platform off of him, but that didn't work either. And so finally, when emergency crews did show up and were able to get this platform up off of day, it was too late. He was already dead. In any factory where a worker needs to go inside of a machine that could maim or kill them if it turned on, they go through what's called a lockout or tagout procedure before stepping foot inside. All it is is they completely incapacitate that machine. Day had no idea about lockout tagout procedures because the only training he got was a 15 minute video that didn't touch on them. And so although Day definitely had reservations about going down underneath this machine, he wanted to make a good first impression on his first day of work at his first job ever. And so he pushed his reservations aside and went down below, believing the supervisor and the operator were looking out for him. When in reality, they, like all of the other other managers and supervisors inside of this warehouse had been trained to prioritize productivity over safety. And so while they definitely knew the lockout tagout procedures, they chose not to do them because that slowed down productivity. And so in this unfortunate example where Day is kind of like a second class citizen within the Bacardi plant because he's a temp worker, his safety was thrown out the window in favor of reaching a quota and it got him killed. Bacardi was ultimately fined $192,000, but after they improved their safety compliance, their fine was reduced to $110,000. Bacardi also paid Day Davis's family $250,000. The staffing agency that employed Davis was not hit with any fines, and to this day, they are still sending temp workers to the Bacardi bottling factory. So that's gonna do it guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we'll pin you at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please offer to do the like buttons laundry, but only dry their clothes about 80% of the way. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three or four video uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's John Ballin 416 I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. I also have a second YouTube channel called Mr. Ballin Shorts where I post random short videos videos, and lost episodes. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.